Hey everyone, cameraman Chris here. Before we start this week's episode, we have a very important announcement for an event that's actually happening this weekend involving our Pokecasters network. To learn more about it, I'm going to turn it over to one of our fellow podcasters real quick, and then we'll get back to the episode. Thanks. What's up, everybody? It's your boy Bagel Noob. I'm the host of Pokemon Go FM and the vice president of the Pokecasters network. Now, I wanted to reach out to everybody to let you guys know about our upcoming charity event on Saturday, December 19th, that'll be hosted all day on our Twitch channel. This event is one that we're going to call our Charity Tabletop Extravaganza, and it's an all-day event starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, going into Sunday the 20th. This charity event will star many of your favorite Pokemon and tabletop podcasters as a cast of Pokemon trainers, announcers, and judges at a world tournament hosted in Pokemon Black 2 and Pokemon White 2's Dravel City. Our story will open on the top eight as some of the world's toughest trainers compete to be the world champion. The trainers will not only have to face each other, but some very mysterious foes. So you, the fans and listeners, have the chance to influence the game. Now, you can do that in several different ways. You can do it by donating to give your favorite trainers advantage on their roles. You can do it by donating to help change the field in which the trainers are battling, much like in anime or Super Smash Brothers. You can even donate to help trigger random events. In addition to using your donations to impact the game and story, you can also win tons of prizes. We have a lot, a lot of prizes for you guys. We have several hundred dollars worth of Pokemon merchandise, including a plethora of really amazing merch from our sponsor, Giraffe Dice, who you can find on Facebook. Now, the best part of all of this is that all the proceeds go to helping sick children. So you can purchase raffle tickets and prizes, even if you cannot attend and win some really great merch while doing good. So come, join us throughout the day. Bring your friends, bring some snacks, and bring your beverage of choice. Help us make a difference this holiday season and end this crummy year on a high note. And once the event is done, we'll upload the audio to our new Pokecasters Network podcast feed, where you can not only find your favorite shows, but additional content from our charity events and community events. You can find the feed on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, and Spotify, and coming soon, we'll have it on iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, podcast and amazon podcast for more information you can check out pokecasters network on twitter facebook pokecastersnetwork.com or in our discord channel thank you everyone and we hope to see you there all right chris what does my favorite pokemon and lucas's interview have in common uh they're t- turtles no they're hot and volcano because <laughs> That's that's dumb because this is this interview had nothing to do with turtles. But it had something was, to do with volcanoes and Torkoal gets eruption and what do volcanoes do? They erupt. Yeah, but I'm not sure we actually talk about Torkoal in this interview. We don't, but we talk about volcanoes <laughs> and they both erupt. Volcanoes. I'm <laughs> We got well, hello listeners. We have a very special episode for you because Don, for the first time, we are on three continents. Yes, we are. Lucas found a very, very special person on Twitter, as, you know, is want to happen when you're on Twitter. I normally just find really, really mean people on Twitter. Yeah, uh, Ed is not mean. I did not get a chance to talk to Ed myself, but for based on the interview and from what Lucas has said, he sounds very nice. But Ed is based in the UK, Lucas is in Japan, and we're here in the US. So this is like, we were going to originally try to do this, like... All of us recording at once, but getting a time that matched those three time zones was not feasible. Yeah, um, that is not a thing that can be done. I mean, it can be done, but someone's recording at three in the morning. Yeah, I mean, yes, we can, but we cannot. Someone is. <laughs> so uh, we have. Uh, so th- this episode is going to be a little bit different. So Don and I we're gonna we're gonna kick off the news, and then we're gonna toss it to this wonderful interview that Lucas conducted with Ed, and then we'll see you all on the other side. So on that, let's just go straight into the news, Don. Yes, let us move forth. Okay, so starting with science news. Did you know that they were reconstructing dinosaur brains, Don? Um, because you told me eight minutes ago, yes. 
<laughs> yes. So there, uh, there is reports. These scientists were able to recreate using 3D, uh, 3D modeling techniques and imaging, recreate a dinosaur brain based off of the impressions from the fossil of its skull. And through doing this, they were able to make some inferences that had not been known about the dinosaur before. I believe it's pronounced the Thecodontosaurus. Um, that sounds good. Essentially, looking at the brains and comparing with other, you know, and what we know of other brains and how it works, they made some assumptions about how it may have walked on two legs as opposed to four, which is what we had thought before, and that it actually would have eaten more meat than uh, was previously thought of. I did not know you could tell what kind of diet something had based off of how its brain looked. I know I heard some, read something a while ago about, like, carnivorous animals typically, I mean, you know, certain primates, I guess, notwithstanding, having sort of a higher level of, like, strategizing, which I guess would make sense, mm. um, since I feel like it's it's harder to catch something than it is to just, like, eat some grass. So maybe there's, like, a level of complexity that's different. You don't have to hunt grass. Right. I'm spitballing here before anyone sends me angry things. But, yeah, that's my thought. Okay. Well, and I, I can't find anything in the in the article they published about that, but that is what they have. Oh, wait. Sorry. Real quick. I just read the thing. It talks about how the structure of its brain um, helped it, like, keep a stable gaze while moving fast, which seems like if you were going to do some, some oh, eating yeah. the meat, that would be like, a useful, like, if you were trying to be chasing stuff, that seems like it'd be a useful activity. Oh, yeah. yeah, that does make sense. One last uh, question about their assumptions. Did they stop to think about whether or not they should? Uh, all I can say is they spared no expense. Ah, good. I'm glad they, uh, I was trying to make some sort of like Grant, like Dr. Grant joke, and I couldn't pull it off, but, um. They do not have a T-Rex. It wants to hunt. <laughs> it doesn't want to be fed. How many Jurassic Park jokes can we get? The answer is a lot. Life finds a way. <laughs> well, there it goes. <laughs> How did we miss that one? All right, so you can kick off the Pokemon news, Don, as a, as a cap to basically the recurring theme for the past couple months. Yeah, all righty. So we um, have our grand champion of Players' Cup 2. Yes. Um, shout out to Wolf Glick. Congratulations. He's pretty awesome dude. Congratulations to him. Definitely really, really great player. Has a great YouTube channel. Definitely worth checking out if anyone is unfamiliar with him. We need like four more Players' Cups, and then we can have a tournament of champions. Yes, so yeah, Wolf had a cool team. It was uh, Rillaboom, Incineroar, Urshifu, Rapid Strike, Galar Moltres, Dragapult, and Colossal. The most interesting thing, sort of, well, there's a lot of interesting things, and I'm not going to go super into his team as a whole because that will take way too long, but Colossal is now a back-to-back Players Cup champion. Yes, this is true. Someone needs to take it down. Yeah, and it's interesting because it kind of, in like the early and middle stages of Players Cup, like Colossal's around. But it never really, never, it never really gets much use, or the ones that do get used don't typically do well. And then it seems like something about that final meta and that final, like the world finals rounds, it's like Colossal's time. He's, he shows up for the big moments. Yeah, but we had a lot of cool teams used. Um, I guess cementing its its own stature, uh, Reggie Gigas got second place. Good good for Reggie Gigas. Yeah, we had, we had a lot of cool teams. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling through now. We had a... Uh, uh, one Nar got uh, fourth with King Drapolitoad and Inte, which are all cool stuff. Yeah, Spectre has definitely picked up picked up lately. It looks like looking at some of this, there was another colossal team um, tied for seventh. We do have a Charizard Torkoal, which makes me happy. We have a a Reggie Draco, which is real cool. Mm-hmm. We have a Reggie Rock. So uh, Reggie Ice and Reggie Steel are the sad boys that don't get representation, which is actually pretty wild. If someone had told me. That like Reggie Rock and Reggie Gigas would be like at the pinnacle of the like a major tournament. I would absolutely not believe. Well, it. it's also funny because in at least in, in Pokemon Go, Reggie Steel is like the only Reggie that you see. Yeah, Reggie Steel just has. I would assume it's because it just has zero offense. Um, and Reggie Ice competes with. I guess now Glastrier. Yeah. Um, it does get to be like dummy thick. I remember it lives because I lost to one at some like premier challenge years ago and i learned that it lives like av reggie eyes lives charizard y overheat in the sun um and i will never forget that because it zap can't me i i will say i watched a little bit of uh i think it was the championship but the one thing that that just made me burst out laughing uh is because wolf had his uh colossal and his urshifu out and he swapped out 
his the Urshifu for a Rillaboom to eat. I think it was a grass move, but more importantly, set the terrain and then he overgrowthed a Yes, a Finny. That was like that was a great play. I can't remember if that was um I don't think that was well that definitely wasn't in the finals because there was no okay. Finny in the finals. Okay, okay. If it wasn't the finals. Yes, but I do remember seeing that. That was a really nice play. And that's kind of like that's the thing is the thing with Colossal is it's always it has a fire move, it has a rock move, and then it's does it have that overgrowth or does it have earth power? And you never get to find out until it's always the opposite of what you want them to have. And that's and that especially I'm pretty sure this game was game three of the of the matchup. And yes, it, it was. Had, yes, it, it was. I remember. And it hadn't shown this. that up until that point. So that was that was uh, I I laughed when that happened. <laughs> well, it is open team sheets. Oh, it was open team sheets. Okay, okay. So they knew they just. <laughs> Oh well, but like it was a play he hadn't gone for, and I don't think he would have picked up the KO without that grassy terrain. So it was, yeah. um, it was definitely a really good play on his end. Yeah, but there was there was some really. I recommend everyone go out and watch those matches. They're on the official uh, Pokemon YouTube day one and two. Definitely a lot of really high level play. The other thing that we've talked about a lot, Don, and I know you hate it, but did you get your Zarud? I have forgot to get it yet. I need to uh, get it. Oh, but you have the code. Yes. Okay, yeah, I just, I downloaded mine today, too. Speaking of mythicals and unrelated, I was, me and some of my friends were going to play in this um, doubles Ubers tournament, which is like a 6v6 doubles. It's like a, um, not, it's an unofficial rule set, but it's it's fun. You're allowed, like, as many Uber mon- big boys as you want. Oh, do, I, I hope Magirna is never, never, ever, ever legal for competitive play. <laughs> is, it a, is it a mess? So anytime something faints, Magirna gets plus one to special attack. It's partner, an opponent, whatever. Oh no! It's ridiculous. Um, I see why. I see why. Again, I don't play. Um, typically play with the smoking rule set, but I see why it was bumped up to Ubers. Um, it is nightmarish. Also, Calyrex Shadow Rider is um very very scary. God, I when they did the, I guess it was the Legends one. I don't even know why I didn't think to use Magirna. now. It's a, it's a really good mod. I think it's um uh I think it's like you re- kind of need the right support for it because it's. It's not that fast. Yeah, it's it's fairly, and I mean for a um, for a, like a restricted format, it's on the slower side because like a lot of the real real stuff, slow stuff. It's like I think it's base sixty. And I know like I've been seeing, I see a lot of like people running with like a final gambit thing and like just final gambit trick room, and then you're already at plus one, then you can start popping off. Um, I've seen some fast ones. I've messed around with it a little bit. I'm definitely new to using Magirna, so I'm probably bad at it. Yeah. But it's um it's a cool it's it's very cool and I like the I like it's um like is it the original form that's the Pokeball looking one I don't that's not the original no I think one. it's that's like the, called the like form. Magirna original or something like that oh yeah yeah and then the Pokeball one is what you get for completing the yes home Pokedex, yes right? and it's neat. yeah all right all right well but we'll keep sliding this along so we can get to the interview but the last thing that I wanted to touch on Don is some TCG news yeah hit hit me so for one we have. I, I'm calling it a sequel because it's it's a similar name, but we have a sequel to last year's very popular set of Hidden Fates, which is which was a mass shiny card dump. And so February, we're getting Shining Fates, which is going to have lots of shiny Pokemon, including a shiny Dragapult set that I might have to buy for myself. Unfortunately, the Elite Trainer box, because I usually buy an Elite Trainer box from the sets that I like, and the Elite Trainer box for this one is G-Max Eevee. Which doesn't really do anything for me, you know? Yeah, is it like, is it just like, what is what is it like, what does it do? I mean, I don't, I, I haven't seen a preview of the card yet. I'm not sure if that's out. So I don't, I mean, I'm assuming it has G-Max Cuddle. But I don't know. I, I, I'm i more inclined to buy the Dragapult set from this one. Right. Because I love Dragapult. And the shiny, shiny Dragapult is pretty cool with the yellow. But the other announcement, which I think actually came out today like officially is the expansion after shining fates is called battle styles you were just telling me about this a little minute ago this is the one you're talking about yep this is it so it is i can't i don't think urshifu has been in the card game yet if anything it was the most recent set but regardless urshifu is definitely in this set and he has his v max form for both rapid strike and single strike and what's cool is that this is a a fresh variation uh, in the, in the card game, what what's cool about the rapid strike and the single strike styles is it's kind of like building an army. They they put out a video on Twitter that I think is awesome, but it has Urshifu just 
beating up other Pokemon, like roundhousing a Whimsicott, which is awesome. I mean, who hasn't wanted to roundhouse a Whimsicott? I hate fighting Whimsicott. Sadly, <laughs> it is resistant to your roundhousing. It was not resistant to Urshifu's in this video. It got I think he's earned his vengeance because how many times Urshifu's get like randomly dazzling gleamed by a Whimsicott that has four special attack investment? Um, I'm sure they really, yeah. really enjoy his vengeance. This was payback. But what's cool about the this new mode, and granted, like, it's all fresh, so there's still, you know, info that needs to come out. But what I'm seeing, based on the images of the cards uh, that they've put out, is that it looks like you're able to mix types a lot better. Uh, so before, like, you would really, like, to maximize energy uses, you would, like, lean into your strongest ones and, and build around that. But... With these, with the rapid strike and single strike, Pokemon besides Urshifu will have that label on them. So, for instance, Embor will be a single strike mon, Octillery will be rapid strike, Empoleon will be rapid strike. I think Colossal is single strike, and all of the abilities that come that come with it help boost or build other single strike or rapid strike Pokemon. So, like Embor's. Uh, ability lets your other single strike Pokemon do 30 more damage. Oh, neat. And, and things like that. And so I think it's cool because I think it, it'll open up decks a lot more. Like you can mix things that maybe wouldn't have mixed in, in previous iterations of the game, you know? Right. Well, that is the last bit of Pokemon news that I had. So do you want to kick it on over to veteran Lucas? Let's uh, Let's send it on over that way. All right, let's hop across the pond and then the other pond. Yes, more traveling jokes. Hey guys, this is Lucas coming all the way from Japan. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Now, while Don and Chris handled the news, I got the delight of getting to handle the interview. So today I am speaking with the one, the only, Ed. How you doing, Ed? Hey, Lucas. I'm doing great. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, this is our volcano episode. So first thing I got to ask, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you study? Okay. So um, I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Leicester. And my um, my PhD project, although I haven't officially started it yet because COVID is being a pain. Indeed. But when I do... Um, I'll be looking at a particular type of volcano called a piecemeal caldera, which calderas themselves are um, quite large volcanoes, which when they erupt, all the magma comes out and it creates this empty void underneath them and it causes the roof to be quite unstable. And so they collapse into themselves, forming this um, depression in the ground. Um, and then we then define them by how they collapsed. So this one is a piecemeal caldera, meaning that it collapsed in segments in different stages. And so um, I'll be looking at a particular piecemeal caldera over here in England, which erupted way, way back in the Ordovician, which is about 400 million years ago. And I'll be trying to figure out um, what happened when it erupted, what happened when it ultimately collapsed, and try and figure out why it collapsed in these stages. Oh, really cool. So, uh, sorry, I did want to ask, being, uh, I'm originally from Florida, so I got into animal life because of the marine life. Mm. How does a fine, upstanding gentleman of the UK get into <laughs> volcanoes, just because they're awesome? Um, yeah, it's a very tricky one for, I think, British volcanologist because <laughs> our nearest ones are probably about Iceland or Italy which is like a two-hour flight away. I think for me it's just sort of watching them on TV has always been the big inspiration and just watching the clips and just going wow and that just hooked me ever since a young age and people said I'd move on I'd grow up and I never have. <laughs> I, I have paleontology friends their friends and parents said the same thing and they're like no I'm sticking to the, the dead dinosaurs or I'm sticking to the fiery hole in the ground. I want to study that. Yep, that is the main thing. I used to have um, a lecturer who would always go and say that, because I did geology at university, he always said people were here because either dinosaurs go rah or volcanoes go bang. 
<laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> oh my god, that is decidedly true. So, I, I am originally from Florida, which is as flat as you can get, aside from Kansas in the United States. There's little to no volcano <laughs> activity. So, I do want to ask, why should people care to study more about volcanoes, especially if you don't live on one? Mm. I mean, yeah, especially in cases like yourself, where, and myself as well, living nowhere near a volcano, you just think only the people who have to care about them are those who live next door to them and are at direct risk to an eruption, um, which is very true. But at the same time, humans love to travel and we can always find ourselves going out and traveling to a volcano because they're always in beautiful, nice hot spots usually, or just in great countries to visit. And that's when the real risk comes into it because for us, we're very nonchalant. It's like, we don't really care about a volcanic eruption. It's not gonna harm us, but then you end up standing in a volcano and you're in harm's way at that point. Can you give people a basic description of what a volcano is? I know that seems kind of silly, hmm. but I want people to hear it from an expert. <laughs> um, okay, so a volcano is... First of all, you have to look at the structure of the Earth itself. So in simplest terms, you've got the core right in the middle, which is a dense ball of... Um, we believe it's mostly metal, like iron and nickel. And then after that, you've got the mantle, which is made up of um, molten material, molten rock. Uh, it can be split into two sections, but we'll talk about it as one just for simplicity. Um, and so all the heat which was created during the formation of the Earth and bom the bombardment of um, the meteors coming together all that heat got locked away inside the earth and has kept the material in it molten. And then on the outside, you have the crust, which is kind of like the uh, when you leave a soup out for too long and the skin goes cold a bit, that's what the crust is. So a volcano is when you get the molten material from the mantle rising up through the crust and it breaks the surface and the magma gets turned into lava by definition, still the same thing, but we like to mm -hmm. keep a distinction between the two. And so the mm -hmm. magma comes to surface, spews out as lava, and then eventually after several um, episodes of this magma spewing out, you start to build up a volcano as you just get layers and layers of lava. All right, you can also get um, like, volcanic uh, sediments as well, volcanic rocks, depending on how the magma um, spews out to the surface, because you can get pyroclastic flows and you can get ash as well. And these can also help to mm -hmm. build up the volcano. So, I mean, I, I went from Florida to living in Japan, which is a giant archipelago built by volcanoes. So all this is good information to know for me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely so. Now, you when you mentioned the process, this is Something I did want to know, because in the United States, we have issues where fracking has caused an increase in earthquake activity. And mm -hmm. that got me thinking, is there anything humans do that can increase or decrease volcanic activity? Or is it just one of those, like, out of our hands? It does what it does. Um, I mean, yeah, there's, I had to look this up as well as to whether we've decided to frack a volcano or not. Um, one, of, <laughs> one or two people, admittedly in the States, did think it would be a great idea for geothermal power, but in the end, <laughs> they decided it was a bad idea because we still don't fully understand volcanoes and how they erupt, so we don't exactly want to go up to one and try and frack it and see what happens, because it, uh, it could actually... Still yeah, essentially, it could speed up the process um, instead. Oh, of, okay. So, yeah, because you could induce cracks, which that the lava, well, the magma could then exploit the cracks and rise to the surface faster. 
<laughs> it's the equivalent of saying, guys, I want power, so I'm going to poke this boiling balloon with a stick and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Pretty much, just, yeah. Just poke the boiling balloon. It'll be fine, guys. Why are you running? Why, why are you leaving? Come back. <laughs> there has been several ideas of, um, like, especially with Yellowstone, that's always a big mm -hmm. one where people just panic about it erupting. And so people say, it's like, well, if a volcanic eruption is the buildup of pressure and then it just explodes, like you're filling up a balloon too much, then can't you just sort of, like, poke a straw in it, you know, <laughs> poke a hole into Yellowstone and just let the air out. And that's also a terrible idea because if we let the pressure out too quickly, then you're just going to bring on Yellowstone, which is the thing you're trying to stop. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm, I, in my old field, when I worked with marine biology and animal biology, you always get people saying, like, oh, we, we want to pick up the wild animal. And you have to tell them, no, that's dangerous. What could possibly be a dumber idea? <laughs> what you just described yeah. was a dumber idea. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is not... I'm, I'm... The best... <laughs> The best I've seen in, it's mostly news articles which report this stuff, but the best that I've read is what would happen if you uh, if you bomb or nuke a volcano to try and stop it from erupting, which is just an even more terrible idea than trying to frack one, really. <laughs> instead of a Especially stick. Especially nuking. Yeah, instead of a stick, use this firecracker. <laughs> Yeah, because they think that it's just the lava inside of it. So if you blow it up, you'll just let the lava come out. But because it's being fed from deep inside the earth, it's just going to keep on erupting, even if you destroy the cone itself. I mean, volcanoes tend to destroy themselves anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you bomb it, it's just going to keep on rebuilding. That is. Oh, I am so sorry for your field <laughs> that you have to deal with that. <laughs> So a little bit into the Pokemon yeah. world. Oh, sorry, a little bit into the Pokemon world. Uh, when we, how I found out who you were is I saw someone post an article about your paper and the use of video games mm -hmm. to teach about volcanology. I'll link that in the description of this episode. But uh, can you tell us from your paper a bit about the volcanoes from the Pokemon world? Because that was, that was fascinating, the work you did for that. So me and my friend, we had... Uh nothing to do really um i was still waiting for um phd applications still trying to get a project but i was still trying to keep my foot in the uh, the geological community and just still trying to build up my um academic profile so um we decided to sort of like play some video games just out of fun of it and decide like what would happen if we took a volcanologist point of view and looked at these video games in a more critical way instead of a more entertaining way and that started off as just sort of blog posts and then spiraled into a paper which is under preprint and hopefully soon a new fully published version will come out with more pictures more facts more fun um one of the games which well, two of the games that we looked at was Pokemon um, Silver and Pokemon Emerald. Uh, and one of the great things about the Pokemon games compared to others is the fact that, unlike in the other games where I have to speculate about the volcanoes in them, speculate like what the source is, what tectonic settings they are, Pokemon, each region is based on an actual place in the real world. So it makes life a lot easier for me. Instead of guessing, I just have to look at where each region is based and look at how the geology is best. You don't have to make up an entire planet's core. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. It's always difficult when you just get given a map and that's it. And you're like, brilliant, what's going on here? But <laughs> Pokemon, all you have to do, especially for the first, is it? first four generations are set in Japan, but the first three are in the South, if I'm right. Yes. Yes. So for me, that makes life a lot easier because, as you've already said, Japan is an archipelago built on volcanoes. So for Kanto, Johto and Hoenn, the volcanic source 
of um, all the volcanoes in the game is actually um, from what are called subduction zones. So when I was talking about the crust, it's actually um, split apart into different plates. And there's two types, there's oceanic plates, which are a lot denser material. And then you've got the continental plates, which are a lot lighter material. And as these move around across the surface of the mantle, they interact in different ways. And when you get an oceanic meeting a continental, because the oceanic is so much denser, it gets forced underneath the continental plate. And so for Japan, it's actually quite a unique one because you've got two oceanic plates, the Pacific and the Philippine plate, which are being both forced under the Eurasian plate. And as these get forced under, the plate then gets melted up and that molten plate then rises back up underneath the Eurasian plate and erupts onto the surface when it eventually melts through. So that is what's building Kanto, Johto and Hoenn and is what's leading to the volcanoes, which the two best ones to talk about would be um, Cinnabar Island, my favorite Pokemon mm -hmm. island of all time. Mainly because in general, oh, okay, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go into why that barren hunk of death is your favorite island. <laughs> well, I mean, for a start, Gen One, <laughs> you've got the volcano gym, which obviously mm -hmm. has to be my favorite. Just personal bias, of course, of one. course. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the mansion, which just the backstory and the lore in Pokemon with Mewtwo's birthplace being there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got the Pokemon lab, which can reanimate fossils. And it's that first time you get to experience it. And I did love in Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, just with the upgraded graphics, that first time you get given Kabuto and you just look oh. down at him. It just looks so cute. Horseshoe crabs are indeed adorable. Like, I, I've held them. They, they are cuddly in their own weird oh, way. <laughs> so lucky there. I'd love to hold one. Uh, it, the trick is to flip them on their back and make sure that the Telson doesn't stab you in the arm. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that's a, uh, quite a painful one there. Yeah, it's not meant to hurt you, but it still can. Mm, still slightly defensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what was the second volcano? I'm sorry, I had to know why Cinnabar, because you're the only person mm. I've ever heard say that. Well, I mean, when you put all of that together on a volcano, it's kind of hard not to love it. Mm -hmm. Also, there's, just before we get to the second one, there's also the fact that because between Gen 1 and Gen 2, there's that time lapse. It's one of the only occasions that I've seen in a video game where you get to see how a volcano evolves and how it erupts and builds up. So you get that sort of volcanic history to it, which is unique in video games. So that's another bit that I love about it. Because mm. most games... I didn't, know, I didn't know Pokemon was better that way. Yeah, because most games are just linear storyline. I mean, you get it in Legend of Zelda with Death Mountains in several of the games, but they change it around it moves on the map all the time and it looks different constantly mm. so it's more of just sort of a location that they're throwing in as an easter egg than an actual historical mm -hmm. development gotcha but then the second one is mount chimney which surrounds most of the storyline for pokemon uh ruby sapphire and emerald and there's a lot going on with Mount Chimney, which is great because there's all the uh, volcanic tremors which happen as you're climbing up the volcano. You've got the active lava pit at the surface and all the ash falling down as well, which is great to see, although there are a lot of problems with that in general. Knew a bit about this from a few other things, but can you explain why running through piles of volcanic ash raining down is not great? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely not the best thing at all. I think this is one of the issues where you get something wrong in a video game 
or if you just sort of, if you don't put enough concern on it, especially from my young mind when I first played these generations back on the Game Boy, like you just think that Ash falling down is kind of like this flower essentially just raining down. It's this nice soft material that you could go rolling around in, especially because you got the little ninja kid who's hiding in the ash and just mm-hmm. jumps out at you. So you think, oh, that'd be cool. Oh, I forgot him about ash. him. Yeah, sneaky little bugger. Mm-hmm. He should be dead yeah, he in is. the ash pile. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's dead now. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely dead now. Because <laughs> ash is not a fine flower. Yes, it's a fine little material but ash is actually fragmented volcanic rock so it happens in extremely violent eruptions when the lava just explodes into tiny particles and so if you look at ash under a microscope it's actually this small jagged fragmented rock so if you think about that it's kind of like quite barbish in a way it's got these sharp points on them Mm. and so inhaling that or even like walking through it and getting in your eyes is gonna cause some serious damage to you i've even heard that it can um clog up internal combustion engines so it pretty much kills every vehicle it goes near as well yeah definitely i mean the uh the 2010 eruption in iceland was a major one for us because uh, that mm. all the ash blew towards Europe and it shut down the um, the airspace above Europe because the ash would just get into mm. the um, internal engines of the planes and it would just fuse back together again because of the heat of it and just clog up the jet engines. So Europe did the smart thing of not letting you travel. Yep. The funny thing was, though, that <laughs> because of the location of the volcano, which I'm not going to pronounce because I can't do it anymore. It's too difficult. (laughs) Because it's located in the south of the island and the wind direction was blowing Mm. to the southeast, it actually meant that planes from America could get to Iceland, but nobody in Europe could fly. (laughs) So Icelandic airspace was fine. European airspace was screwed. (laughs) I'm just imagining a bunch of Icelandic people sitting in their geysers with their fermented shark, like going, this is a great day. I wonder how everyone else is doing. Meanwhile, people in England, literally with somehow cloudier skies than normal, just like, Iceland. (laughs) Pretty much, yep. That was the way it was going. (laughs) Uh, So before we get into the actual Pokemon, I had one other question for you. With the, let's say, mixed messaging of volcanoes... If you could design a volcano for the next generation, what would you implement into that volcano that would make it fun for gameplay, but still realistic? This is this is a question that I've been asked a lot in regards to my research. It's always one of those tricky ones, because you want the games to be entertaining. At the end of the day, that's why they've been made, for us to have fun. Mm-hmm. And volcanic eruptions there's just something about them there's just that wow factor in them but it's just so great to watch them explode whether it's in a cutscene or as you're running through it all so you don't want to lose that which is the main thing but from what me and my friends found out while doing our research was that the visuals of volcanoes tend to look fine few bits here and there which are wrong but the rest of it lava looks like lava volcano looks like a volcano so that's all good it's the hazards which are the things which are most depicted incorrectly or not even depicted at all so the whole problem with the uh, the people around mount chimney running around in the ash is all wrong (laughs) and so that would be (laughs) the thing that we'd have to change and it's not a difficult thing you just i'd like to see a little bit more concern to it a little bit more worry and i was even thinking it's like maybe you could get an upgrade to the gogo goggles those ones needed for the desert and so upgrade them just put a mask on it you know include the goggles as well (laughs) because you don't want ash in your eyes but just upgrade it to have a mask Mm -hmm. And even if you like, you try to walk down the routes which have all the ash in them. Like, just have a message come up saying you can't go in there. You don't want to breathe in ash. It could hurt. 
just something simple mm-hmm. like that or even yeah, something with, to educate a 10 year old exactly yeah or like with the people yeah. standing next door to the lava as well lava is hot you don't want to stand next door to it mm-hmm. so just have them standing a few meters away you know maybe even with improved graphics just have them sweating a little bit you know i kind of wondered that about the battle at the top of mount chimney are all those trainers like doomed because they're they're pretty close to that volcano yeah i mean they would definitely have severe burns on their arms because most of them are in t-shirts as well yeah yeah the team aqua guys literally brought water to a firefight to a and that normally would work out but i think the volcano beats the water yeah there's there's only one case where water has actually beat a volcano um it was really yeah it was uh it was in iceland it was i had to look this up to get all the facts for it but there was a volcano called um the eldfell volcano and it was Mm -hmm. it produced a lot of lava which was heading towards a harbor and obviously with this town its main economic resource was fishing and so they didn't want to lose the access to the sea so they decided it's like well if we don't do anything now the lava will block off the sea so they got some pumps in and literally spent several months pumping cold seawater onto the lava to try and stop it and fantastic. did it work it actually did manage to work it literally it started erupting in, in january and it finished in july but they did manage to stop it and they saved huh. their harbor by doing it Good job, guy. No, that's that's actually pretty cool. Good job, Iceland. That kind of makes up for... Well, no, it doesn't make up for the volcano clouding Europe. But, you know, it's yeah, something. It's something. It's for one case where yeah. somebody fought yeah. a volcano and won. But it's only because they were literally <laughs> right next door to the sea and had unlimited water supply. Now, think of how effective they could be if they bombed it <laughs> and put water on it. Jeez. Exactly. It'd be so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, see, this is the American way. We do something the proper way and then throw a bomb with it, and then it works out. Everything just works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Americans have tried to bomb volcanoes in Hawaii, hoping that would work, and it didn't. Yeah, I didn't think it would. No. All right, we've had a lot of fun talking about the volcanoes, but let's get into the Pokemon. All right. All right, so, Ed. Uh, let's start off with what could actually be considered the first volcano Pokemon. Uh, in Johto, they had the Cinequil line. I'm, I believe you're familiar with it. I am very familiar with it. I love the Cinequil line. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm an odd one out here, but it is by far my favorite starter evolution line. And I'm here to tell you, you're not alone. Yay. When it came to Johto, I, I followed my same rule. I picked Cinequil. Why wouldn't I pick Santa Quill? Exactly. He's so cute. And then he just spurts flames out his back. My brother always picked the water types and I always picked the fire types. And he's he's adorable. Exactly. He's got the traits of, yeah, he's got the traits of an anteater, a hedgehog, an echidna, all these things put together. He's, he's, he's cute. He's nice. Exactly. You can't not love him. I mean, I mean, he he's not the punchline like Chikorita. And he, I mean, my friends like reptiles, but he's just, he's adorable. He needs some love. Exactly. <laughs> the reason I wanted to bring him up was that Typlosion, um, when you read the Pokedex entries, especially from way back when, you notice a trend of them getting more scientifically accurate in most cases. Mm. Uh, in Typlosions, it, it pretty much just stays the same. And the thing that I found that was most telling was uh, Typlosion is said to literally light anything it touches on fire. And I'm just like, um, why am I training this thing? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering that one as well. Just, like, if it sets anything on fire with its fur, you can't even give it a stroke. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the whole mechanic. Oh, let me touch it. Oh my god, no! Do you just have, like, an extinguisher ready? <laughs> Probably. I also read that it causes explosions if you stroke it. So you're literally yeah. blowing off your hand by giving it a pet. That's just sad. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. It's like the thing. It's like the toy you can't touch before Christmas, or you're gonna get in trouble. But it's so tempting. I want to touch and it. It's one that your parents will know if you touched it as well. Yeah, like the house has gone. Like Ed, 
Ed, did you touch him? No, no, mom, I didn't. I didn't I touch can. him. Did you touch him? No. He <laughs> touched himself. <laughs> Where's the house, Ed? No, he, he was he was giving himself a scratch. I swear. He rolled over. <laughs> The the other thing I wanted to get into, because I think this is better with it, the literal volcano Pokemon is Quilava, and unlike its <laughs> unlike its big brother, instead of lighting things and blowing up everything it touches, it's apparently fireproof. And which I think is a brilliant concept for a fire Pokemon. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's a great idea in general. I think all fire Pokemon should kind of have that ability in some regard of like, oh, I can just, I know it's already an ability in the game, but throwing fire at more fire isn't how you use fire to kill fire. But no, <laughs> it did lead me to thinking when you go to a volcano, you often see these people walking around in big silver clunky suits. And I'm wondering what, mm. what is that? What is the material? Um, so, I actually had to look this one up because you're right. When you think about people visiting volcanoes, you think of these stereotypical suits, which kind of look like silvery spacesuits, but we don't actually wear them too often oh, really? in volcanology. No, it's, you can even go your entire career without wearing one. Wow. Because they're only for the people who need to go up to lava and, go up to an active crater whereas most of us just try and stay away from it or look at dead volcanoes like i'm doing that's intern timmy's job timmy get up that volcano put the suit on yep <laughs> we'll just walk from here don't worry we got binoculars Shout if you need it yeah we, we got the drone going so we can catch every moment of it don't worry then why do you need me get up there timmy <laughs> do as you're told do it get me that lava or else. <laughs> So the material they use is just some kind of heat-proof material? Um, so originally in the 1930s, they were made out of asbestos. That's not great. No, but back then they thought it was brilliant, so they put asbestos everywhere they could, so why wouldn't you put it in clothes? Ugh. But then after that, it turns out the modern process is to use... Um, a vacuum technique which creates atom thick layers of aluminium and they thread them into material so they're you're basically wearing tinfoil in a way okay made out of aluminium <laughs> sorry you're the first person on this podcast to pronounce aluminum in the uk way and it's just like oh <laughs> right different continent different english got it <laughs> yeah we always get angry at the aluminum pronunciation you notice i didn't get angry i didn't this is a difference no. in our english it's fine we can be okay with it it's all good we can be friends <laughs> <laughs> that's all right then that's fine yeah i think that it would be interesting like in a game mechanic if you had like to go near a volcano and you had a suit, and in like the notes for the item, it's like made with quilava fur. This thing can stand up to any heat. That would be amazing to see. That I would actually love more inclusions of that, especially with other Pokemon as well, just to incorporate the Pokemon more into the real. Well, yeah, I say the real world. <laughs> the Pokemon world. Yeah, just incorporate it into the different parts. If you live on the beach, oh yeah, the Sharpedo literally pops out teeth like no big deal. So we just use their teeth for knives. Like, just something like that. Would, yeah, using for Kulava, he's good for fireproof suits. That's why you keep him around. If anything, I think better. Because I was looking at the temperatures that they could withstand. And basic volcano ones, they withstand temperatures about 420 degrees Celsius. Oof. The higher ones can withstand... 1100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so for, so sorry, for the American listeners, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, trust me. It trust that's, uh, me. <laughs> over two thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You have to keep using Fahrenheit with us. I'm so sorry. Why do you keep using Fahrenheit? Or is that just a question I shouldn't ask? No, no. You can ask it. It's fine. To be honest, it's just that the system has become so integrated into the society. It would take a generation to wipe it out, and there would be people fighting in the streets to keep it simply because they attach their American identity to it. 
it's the American way. Yeah, it's it literally is that. That's pretty much the reason is a, a culture attached something dumb to their society, and now that dumb thing is going to probably be the death of them. So to get back to it, there were two Pokemon that stand out, and other Pokemon podcasts and YouTubers have brought these two up over and over and over again. Macargo and Camerupt, specifically mm. because of their temperatures. Yeah, it's it's a funny one, because if you look at the temperatures, well, nothing is mentioned for Slugma, but for Nummel, it says that its, uh, tem- its core temperature is um, 1,200 degrees Celsius, or 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's insane. But Camerupt, <laughs> Camerupt is just takes it beyond that to temperatures which i don't understand myself i i had to look it up that is multiple times hotter than the sun like it is yeah like these living things are quite could quite literally the second you put them on the field everything melts even the atmosphere yep quite easily there's um there's a brilliant picture or like screenshot from one of the animes where a little girl is hugging a macago i just laugh at that so much <laughs> oh, all the time he's my little friend literally but in reality the second she he, she's my little, ah! it's it's that scene from terminator 2 where um sarah, <laughs> sarah connor's holding the fence she's like Pfft. Just blowing up the face, <laughs> melting it. I mean, that kid wouldn't even get close. It's just in the cargo. Apparently, like with that kind, since this is hot at the sun, it would probably you wouldn't be able to see it. No one would know what a macargo looked like because the second you looked at it, you are literally blinded by the miniature sun. Yeah, like it's just, how do you eat? quite easily? It's it's insane. So no, just to clarify, volcanoes do not get to eighteen thousand degrees Fahrenheit or close to or what was it? Close to ten thousand degrees Celsius. No, the uh, the general range for lavas it depends on their um their silica content, mm-hmm. their silica dioxide content, mm-hmm. and the more silica in it, the colder it gets. But you tend to get um, rhyolites, which are about sort of 68% silicate. They're around 650 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. And then as you get less silica in it, you head towards um, basalt, which is about 45 to 53% silica. And that's about 1200 degrees mm. Celsius. Right on. So that's more towards Nummel's temperature, mm-hmm. which is wise, so better. Nummel is more reasonable. Yeah, although I still question how Nummel is able to contain molten magma in its stomach. I mean, okay, so have you ever had what is known as a shrimp po' boy? No, I haven't. It's basically, but I want to. it's fried shrimp that's been turned into a 12, of uh, <laughs> uh, turned into about, uh, I'm trying to do it in meters, Basically about a third of a meter, like you just make a sandwich, a third of a meter long filled with fried shrimp and like sauce. And it just, it is delicious, but that acidity will burn you for days. I feel it's kind of like that perpetually. Mm, Yeah. You can understand why numb or sort of like so chill and relaxed if it's just dealing with a burning stomach. It's like 24 seconds. You want to go for a run? Not right now. I'm just going to stay here until you need a battle. Or maybe he's just like, I need to stay calm because if I freak out, I'm going to blow up and you're going to be upset. Yeah, he's actually in his zen place. He's just not feeling anything. But you snap him out of it, he'll be screaming everywhere. <laughs> do you want me to blow up the house like Cyndaquil? I'll do it. Don't, <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't t- I'll do it. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. <laughs> but just to be clear, camera up to my cargo should not be that hot. <laughs> No, nowhere near. No, no, I didn't. I didn't think so. Now, I did want to get to. So, while Cinequil is like the first official volcano Pokemon, there was one Pokemon that's been living in volcanoes before they were around, and that's Magmar. I want to hear your thoughts on this Pokemon. I, I think Magmar is actually a pretty decently realistic one. Okay. Um, you... in some factors. Okay, that's what I was waiting for. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at the design right now, Ed, and uh, I need you to explain. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely need somebody to explain what the hell a magma actually is, <laughs> like biologically. I, dude, that's my specialty. Like my degree is in integrated animal biology, and I'm like, I don't know, man. It's some kind of duck. What do you want from me? Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it kind of looks like a lizard, but when you look at his face, you just see duck. Is this like the platypus? Like the platypus of the Pokemon world is a magmar. It's just not. It's like it's got lizard yeah. lizard features in the back, duck face, lives in a volcano, can spit toxic gas. It's the closest we're going to get, although I hope that there'll be an Australian region yes. Pokemon game which actually has a platypus. <laughs> no, no. Collins is the one who's always going for it. Collins, uh, they they go on and on and on all the time. It's it's great. I love it. But um, in in the Pokemon game, it's said to burn about the same temperature as normal. So it's it burns at a super. It's born in an active volcano. So that's one thing that's weird. Yeah, yeah definitely there. But it's the temperature which I don't have any bother with because, as you say, it's the same temperature of normal, which we've said is like a realistic lava temperature so if it's born in a volcano for it to burn at that temperature i can understand yeah i mean when it evolves it burns at about 3600 degrees fahrenheit so it's a little less realistic then yeah we're going towards camera up to this point yeah it's just get, when it evolves. i guess there's a certain threshold just normal is like right at the line and any higher it's just well you've just burned the atmosphere you've burned the villages you can't go anywhere uh, I did think it was interesting, though, that in Alola, they mentioned that, it, it, since it's based on Hawaii, that they are hardier mm. due to the extreme heat, due to the increased volcano activity and, and climate. Uh, I can't remember if we mentioned it before, but yeah, Alola, with it being Hawaii, is sat on top of a volcanic hotspot. So instead of it being subduction plates, it's actually a hotspot which is feeding it, mm -hmm. which is basically just like an unusually hot bit of the mantle and so that's forcing the lava up instead of it being plates melting and so um that's what's producing hawaii and the lava there does tend to be basaltic so it is towards that higher end of the 1200 degrees celsius mm -hmm. towards the magma temperature okay so again living in a volcano is not very realistic but I know there are definitely yeah. there are animals that live around volcanoes. I mean, there are definitely birds and different other critters that can live there. Yeah, I'm sure there's a few specialized lizards, especially. There is a, be loving yeah, there's a snail that goes that gets passed around the biologist group. That's um, it's capable of living near and around volcanoes, and it consumes the food it needs to have almost an iron-like coating to keep it heat-proof. And it's like. Just one of those extremophiles, those animals that can truly survive in some of the worst places on the planet. But it's not like you're going to see, like, you're at the top of the volcano. I've made it. Is that a squirrel? Yeah, definitely not around most. Although, you could probably get it in some places. Like, I have seen trees at the top of um, some volcanoes. Not for long. But yeah, not for long until the next eruption yeah. and then that's it i mean i did hear that there is some pretty fertile soil after all the chaos yeah that's one of the main draws for living near a volcano if you're a farmer then you're gonna love the fertile soil yeah and the land's gonna be dirt cheap after everyone's running away from it so it's it's kind of helpful a little bit mm-hmm all right, so the last Pokemon I wanted to talk about, and uh, for those of you listening, you're probably thinking, why didn't you get to Entei yet? Like, Entei can bark and start volcanoes? I, I got nothing for that. Ed, you got anything for that? No, it's as much as it's called a volcano Pokemon, the only thing I can think of is it makes them, but how it makes them, I'm not a clue. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not great. So I did want to make the shift to the one Pokemon I know that could be horrifying to the world and i actually talked about it in one of our lectures um groudon and <laughs> how horrifying it would be if it woke up yeah, yeah definitely i mean it basically how the pokemon game explains its ability is that not only does it increase the sunlight to dry up the water it also activates volcanoes all over the world to create land so my question to you is what would happen if something snapped their fingers and every volcano decided to erupt? Ooh, 
I don't think life would survive for much longer. <laughs> Just and apart from the extreme of I knew it. I, I, sorry, I talked about them, Team Magma having the worst plan, and it's like, I knew it was worse than Team Aqua's. I knew it. We're all going to die. Yeah. I did listen to that one. I did love your comments on it. <laughs> We're all going to die. I knew it. I'm so glad I can confirm that. My my brother was like, nah, Team Aqua's are way worse. Your podcast is wrong. Well, hey, Miguel, Vulcanologist just said I was right. Ha! <laughs> well, one of the, uh, the things with it which tends to get left out of um like volcanic outreach talk is volcanic gases because a volcano does actually emit gas it is actually dissolved in the magma as it rises up mm-hmm. and some of that um like you can get carbon dioxide carbon monoxide um some of it can react with water and create sulfuric acid so if you're getting all the volcanoes around the world erupting and spewing out all of these toxic gases, that's not going to help for a star. So what would kill us faster, the gas or the extreme heat? Um, it depends on your proximity, I'd say. Let's say, but... let's use you. Let's use you. You're in the UK. You're, I don't know, something stereotypical. Drinking tea, enjoying Boxing Day. I don't know what you people do. <laughs> And then isol- everything around the world just goes kaboom. What happens to you? I'd say probably we'd get another case of Iceland again where the ash would get to us first, mm. then followed by the gases. And we'll probably be safe for a while before the lava gets to us. Gotcha. So you have time to finish the tea is what I'm trying to <laughs> trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the tea will be cold before the lava then starts to rewarm it up for us okay good I, again i i'm living in japan right now so i i know a little bit about what cold tea feels like a little bit <laughs> just like oh i really wish this was warm why am i sad I have, to, I have to admit i'm probably gonna get quite a bit of hate from any of my friends who listen to this but i don't like tea but, dude this is a safe place I'm not going to be like, get him, get him, boys. All of a sudden, like, your door opens. Just, just yeah, I'm just waiting for somebody to kick down my door now. And MI6, like, open up! Boom. Just runs in, breaks everything, takes you away. Oh, Hey, Lucas, what happened to Ed? Uh, last I heard, he went to some sort of re-education camp. He's fine now. They're just forcing tea down me. Just no! I've got an IV drip of tea. At least put some lemon. God. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So we know Groudon would kill us all. And so would Camera Up and Macargo. Mm. But at least three of the Pokemon we talked about won't kill us. And that's good enough for me. My one final question. I got one final question before I let you go and enjoy your day. What Pokemon would you like to see made that is based on a volcano? <laughs> That's what the question we try and ask everybody at the end of our interview. Based on your study, normally we have animal people, so this I'm really interested in. What feature Ooh. of a volcano would you like to see turned into a Pokemon? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Because, I mean, one of my favorite parts of volcanoes and their eruptions are pyroclastic flows, which, um, for those who don't know, they're sort of these dark bellowing massive clouds of um, boiling hot gases and molten rock which just avalanche their way down um, volcanic slopes but to try and pokemonify that would be very difficult it'd be easier to use as an attack and that would be an amazing attack to have like a one hit ko oh wow just like a one hit ko move like just a fire based one hit ko move just like 30 percent chance yeah. to hit but when it hits it's like now they're all gone <laughs> i think it would that would be awesome i mean yeah i love that yeah i mean we're not most of us are battlers and we wouldn't use it but i think that would be a really cool addition to the game to give all these fire these volcano based pokemon the ability to just kill and just wipe out the opponent with ash because you don't think about the ash. And there are so many yeah. movies where you just, oh, no, he's outrunning it. He can outrun that. It's just a cloud. Yeah, no. I think the last one which I watched was the uh, the last Jurassic World movie. Yes. Which 
that has a pyroclastic flow. Uh, and I'm sorry for anyone listening, but Chris Pratt would be dead. Yeah. 100%. No, we've... Yeah, he's dead. We don't really care for that movie on multiple levels, biologically, paleontology, cinematography. No, it's not the best. Yeah. It's, it's just... it's not. There's a lot wrong with it. Yeah. But they do get the pyroclastic flow right. Like, visually, it's very accurate. And you wouldn't be able to outrun it like he isn't able to. But he wouldn't come out the other end of it. Did he make it? Like, it's just the rest of the movie. It's just like, nope. And just Chris Pratt disappears. He's just gone. You don't need him yeah. no more. End of the movie. That's it. You know, yeah, said, well, don't make a bird. It's fine. You just like see the, did he make it? And then the screen goes dark. And then you just hear the, da, 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 da. <laughs> the credits start rolling. Like, what? <laughs> no, he's dead. Game over. <laughs> uh, that's the end of the new trilogy. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> Yeah, now we can just stop. Let let the dinosaurs die, like you did in the movie. Let yeah. let the dinosaurs die. <laughs> All right. So Ed, I want to say thank you so so much for being part of this. It means the world to me that you would come and share your amazing knowledge with us. Thank you very much for having me. I mean, anytime you need another volcano consultant, you know where I am. Yeah, we do. We have it on record now too. You can't escape. You're one of us now. <laughs> Yep, no, that's it. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, where can our fans reach out to you? What's the best way to contact you if they have questions about PhDs, if they have questions about papers, or just want to know about volcanoes? Are you available for helping people out? Yeah, I'm more than happy to help people out, especially with PhDs. I spent three years trying to get one, so I know, especially the UK system, very easily. Um, but if you want to find me, the best place is Twitter. Uh, my handle is at the volcano guy with underscores between each word. <laughs> I found that was so easy to find you. Some people like like me use like, oh, here's our basic name. Here's our size. What's your the volcano guy? Hmm. Yep. I see a lot of people with like, as you said, basic ones in their names. I was like, if I'm going to make a handle, I've got to make it fun. I've got to stand out somehow. So the volcano guy. Yeah, no, I mean, it works, man. Again, thank you so much for being a part of this show. Uh, Don, Chris, you're probably listening to this as well. Uh, you may have gotten the fish guy from me, but I got the volcano guy in your face. Back to you. And we're back. I'm sure that you miss Don and myself very much in that interlude with Lucas and Ed. But I think it was a very, very uh, interesting discussion that they had. So he's he's written a little bit about volcanoes uh, in games. He's, uh, as he said, he's just starting his PhD. So we wish him all the luck in in the future as he goes moves forward with that. But it is, I I think he, we might have to find some more volcano. Hey, he didn't talk about Torkoal, so I think we need to get him back and get him with you to talk yes, about Torkoal. Yes, he's going to talk about how he's the best Pokemon. Yes, the best volcano representation ever. Signed, Ed. Suck it, camera up. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, again, everyone, we want to thank you for giving us your time and giving us a listen. We hope that you learned something and that you had some fun while you were doing it. If you could leave us a review on your podcasting or podcast listening app of choice, it helps others find the show. We would really appreciate it just to kind of keep building this wonderful community uh, that we have here. So thank you all for your time with the holidays coming up. We wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. We are going to have a very special holiday-themed episode for you in two weeks, so get excited for that. I know we are all excited to record it. Yes, yes we are. I'm looking forward to some holiday cheer and some other holiday emotions that one has. (laughs) I couldn't think of anything other than cheer. Uh, it, it'll just be, I, I love cold weather and we're, pro- and we might be getting snow and I love snow. So I'm just, what I'm looking forward what, to it. What is this snow? Okay. I will say I have in fact seen snow like several times. Um, I've been to like Colorado where there's like lots of snow in the mountains and whatnot. And I am a fan, but yes, I am, I am aware of snow. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, Don, I think we should just wrap it up. So again, thank you everyone. Uh, Take care, be safe, and happy holidays. Have a nice one out there, everybody. You wanted to say howdy again, didn't you? Stop myself. Actually, I didn't even think about it, and now like I'm thinking about it. (laughs) All right, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.